Welcome again to a short stop with a short stop. Glad to see everybody again. Glad to be back with you. We're going to look today a little bit about the life and times of a, a baseball player and then try to compare it a little bit with, uh, with heaven. When I was in the eighth grade, uh, there was a Cincinnati Red Scout. His name was Gene Bennett. He walked up to me and gave me his card, and he said, I'm going to be seeing a lot of you. And lo and behold, Gene became one of my best friends. Uh, uh, Cincinnati Reds didn't draft me, but uh, he lived in Portsmouth, Ohio. And uh, he's passed away now, but we've done baseball clinics together, and anytime uh, I needed him, he came. And, he always called me to help him with his clinics and, and different things of that nature. But it was something that I, I, I remember and something that I really cherish in my life of, of knowing Gene Bennett. But when I became a junior and, and senior in high school, there was 26 major league teams uh, here at that time. And at my games, there would be sometimes there would be 50 scouts at each and every single game that I played. And my senior year, there was a, a scout from the Philadelphia Phillies. His name was Tony Lucadella. He, he's written several books on scouting, and a lot of the scouts still buy those books and, and read it and, and uh, try to go buy some of the things that he's taught them in, in that book. But Tony used to come and get me out of school. I mean, literally during baseball season, he came and got me out of school and took me over to the uh, park and playground where our baseball field was at. And he, he, he would always look at me. He'd say, do you know anybody can throw batting practice? I said, yeah, R.J. Williams. And he would get R.J. out of school. We'd go over to the ballpark, and R.J. would throw me batting practice. And then after we got done with that, Luke Adela took me over into the tennis courts and hit me ground ball after ground ball after ground ball because he wanted to simulate AstroTurf. And lo and behold, one day, you know, Golf season was going on at the same time then as baseball in high school. It was a spring sport. Nowadays, golf is a, a, a fall sport. But then I played baseball and golf at the same time. But my arm got so sore one day that uh, I told Coach Ack, I said, Coach, I can't even throw on the first base. They've been working me out so hard. And he said, why don't you just take the day off and go play golf? And the next day, Coach, he said there was fifty some scouts here ready to watch you, and they were all madder and horny. But I couldn't, I couldn't throw one to first base if I wanted to. But these scouts would come to school, take me down into the basketball locker room. They would give me eye tests. They would give me uh, other kind of tests to, to see how smart I was. Uh, some of them literally called me at home and asked me what I was eating for dinner. But some of them were literally going around <clears throat> my home in the neighborhood that I lived in and were knocking on people's doors and asking them what kind of a, a person that I was. They were doing their due diligence as far as uh, making their scouting reports back to their bosses and, and letting them know <clears throat> what type of a player I was, whether I could hit, field, run, throw. But not only that, they, they wanted to know every single little thing about me. Finally, on June the 2nd, 1973, two days after I graduated from high school, <clears throat> uh, Bud Perry, he was the owner of the Paintsville Hurl at that time, <clears throat> he gave me a call. He said, it just came across my wire. You've been drafted by the San Francisco Giants in the very first round. You were the sixth player in the nation taken. And I said, oh, wow. Uh, the very next day, Hugh Poland, which was a scout for the San Francisco Giants, he lived here in Kentucky, he was knocking at the door, and my phone's ringing, and it's Coach Brock. He's the, he was the head baseball coach at Arizona State. So I've got the scout at the front door, I've got the coach from Arizona State on the phone, and they're both wanting to know what I'm going to do. But as the story goes, I signed with the Giants. But I had an opportunity to, to go to Arizona State and play baseball there and get an education. But 
I was drafted in, in 73. Two days after I was drafted, I was on a plane uh, to uh, Arizona. We had a 10-day a, a spring training there in, in Casa Grande, Arizona. Then they flew us to Great Falls, Montana, where we played our first season. Uh, the season was over in September. Set, about September the 10th, I had to catch another plane and go back to Arizona for what they call fall instructional league. And then in 74, I started out in Decatur, Illinois, which was the low A ball team. And then halfway through that season, they called me up to Fresno, California, which was the high A ball team. And then in 1975, I skipped double A and went straight to triple A in Phoenix, Arizona. <clears throat> and at the end of that year, 1975, when they expand the roster and go to 40 men in, in the big leagues, I was called up to the big leagues in, in 1975. Would have been just been starting my junior year there at Arizona State, but they called me up to the big leagues. And I, I want to tell you, you know, I'm, it, it was like being in heaven. That was the ulti ultimate to me. Playing in the minor leagues, uh, getting called up to the big leagues, it was all something that I, some people call it work, but it, it, it wasn't work to me. It was like being in heaven. I, I enjoyed it so much. I did it every day and never complained about it. But what a lot of people really don't understand <clears throat> and that it's, it's hard to get drafted. It's hard to move your way up in the minor leagues. It's hard to get to the big leagues. But the hardest thing of, of it all, it, it, it's hard to stay there. But Jesus did something for us. And John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, it says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way that where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And then if we turn to Revelation chapter 21 <clears throat> and read verses 1 through 4, it, it very calming uh, verses here. And it said, this is John, the apostle John talking he said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready for the bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among you. And he said, Dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Now listen to this in verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The, th the first things have passed away. This is going to be a place of total joy. I mean, it's going to be happiness every day, 24 hours. Well, it's going to be eternity. Absolute eternity. Uh, but you know, he gave us some warnings in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. It reads as follows. <clears throat> Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leadeth to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there be few that find it. Wow. That's not Johnny LeMaster saying that. That's Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount. There's going to be few that find it. And if we go back in the Old Testament and we look at Noah, he preached for 120 years trying to get people on the boat. And it ended up only Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wife. Eight people out of the whole world uh, ended up saved. But today, Jesus, in John 3, 16, God for God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son, that each and every one of us could be saved. In Jesus' eyes, everybody is a number one draft pick. 
Jesus is not going to trade anybody. Jesus is not going to sign free agents to take your place or your job. Uh, he's not going to sell you, but he wants to keep you right under his wings so that he can protect you at all times. But the way that he does that is you have to obey him the way that Noah wanted them to listen to him as far as his presentation that, that God gave him. But nowadays, God wants us to listen to his son. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, again, back to the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. How do we get to heaven? If we ask, we need to, in uh, Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, we need to confess Jesus before men. If uh, we seek, we need to repent. Uh, Luke 3.13 tells us to repent lest we perish. And then if we knock, uh, if we knock, we need to be baptized. Uh, in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, Why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? Then we've obeyed God's plan or Jesus' plan for, for salvation. Then we have a right or an opportunity of being heaven if we continue on as Revelation 2.10 tells us, be faithful unto death. And then what? We're going to receive a crown of righteousness. Baseball to me was heaven. To a Christian, heaven is almost unspeakable because we really don't know what it's going to be. We just know that it's going to be the most glorious, happy place that we've ever seen. But the one thing we need to remember is that it's for eternity. We're either going to spend eternity in heaven or we're going to spend eternity in hell. I love you. I love your soul. But the thing about it is God loves your soul more because He sent His only begotten Son. I'll see you next time on a short stop with a short stop.